Good morning. Welcome to Edusat Network. Friend, you know, today we are going to discuss media economics. Media economics is a little bit difficult topic to difficult to understand, difficult to comprehend. What is the exactly uh, media economics means? We have tried to understand this uh, topic in the last few lectures, and you also might have seen the lecture available on the YouTube. But there are concepts and the other aspects which are very uh, sometimes appear to be cumbersome and difficult to comprehend. So we have tried to understand uh, today's lecture again the historical and contemporary perspective of media economics and also the economic and associated aspects of media, uh, media economics or say the media business. So we, this is kind of uh, again uh, introductory and insightful lecture will be today. And for discussion on this very topic, we have in the studio the same resource person, Dr. C. P. He is a uh, senior academician, trainer, and presently dean of University School of Mass Communication in Gurugram in Impress University. And uh, he is also an uh, eminent uh, uh, scholar, has written many books on the different topic uh, covering uh, broadcast journalism and web journalism, and has presented a number of papers at different forums, different conferences, and seminars. And continuously been uh, uh, trying to uh, have a kind of view on the media economics uh, uh, and talking to uh, scholars and what could be the best in the Indian setup and win Indian situation. So his contribution, or we say, in uh, his in area of interest is the media economics. So certainly the today lecture will help us to understand this topic and, uh, and give insight how to uh, study or how to take up the media economics and the economic and associated aspect of the media economics. So on your behalf, I welcome him for the Edusat lecture on this very topic. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, dear listeners, welcome to this fourth lecture, if I remember correctly, on media economics. Today, uh, in response to certain questions that have come to me from the listeners and the, the students of media economics, we are trying to understand uh, the domain of media economics from its historical and operational perspectives and also to the extent possible the, the contemporary challenges that are up to be dealt with by the policy makers, the academics, the practitioners and professionals alike. Today uh, we will have a very holistic view, holistic view in the sense that things that are coming up today, what is the sequence of events over the last 100 years or so, not only in this country but other countries where the media systems are more developed, more evolved and are there things for us to learn from them and to what extent we can learn from them and in what manner we need to customize uh, our own tools of analysis and our own tools of problem solving in response to the challenges at hand from different uh, domains or vehicles, for example, television or radio or internet or mobile or newspapers or magazines. Broadly, we will have a uh, look at the things like uh, in what kind of systems we operate, uh, what are the basic motive or the incentive or the system of incentives and disincentives that drive the media managers, the industry people, the owners, the executives, and what are the trains of ownership? Are there conglomerates operating? Are the big businesses coming up? Are there mergers and acquisitions? Or there are small businesses that are thriving? Or they have an important uh, role to play? Are there alternative business models? Are the traditional systems of revenue, for example, advertising and subscription by the consumers or selling of media products and services to the consumers enough? And if not enough, what are the alternative things that are coming up? Is there any scope in practice or potential? hybrid of the hybrid revenue structures and if there is any scope, is there anything in practice that is coming up 
and what is the future or the potential of such hybrid structures in the revenue models. Is there any predictable pattern, business pattern in the media industry as there is in many other industries from different stages one to another to another before finally a sort of metamorphosis or restructuring takes place. Then if there are different uh, kinds of markets that are coming up, the traditional concepts of market may not be uh, sufficient to understand the evolving market structures and what are the multi-platform systems of delivery of the content, consumption of the content, whether it is from uh, individual to a large chunk of people, from large chunk of people to a large chunk of people, or from individual to individual, or a mix of all these. And finally, if time permits, how the role of government has been so crucial to the development of the media systems globally, both in terms of the kind of content that they provide and also the kind of infrastructures that have been raised by different companies, industries, organizations of different kinds with different ownership patterns over the last few hundred years globally and a few decades in India. Before we move on to the nitty gritties, we would like to have some of the elements, understanding of some of the elements or the financial foundations in which we are operating. We are discussing a system of media that is broadly operating for profits. That is, individual organizations operating trade industry for profits. This doesn't mean that non-profits are not there in operation and they are absolutely insignificant, but mostly we are talking about a system that is operating for profits. It could be driven by individual proprietorship companies or it could be corporate giants or it could be a cooperative system that uh, may have different uses of the surplus money or the profits that come apart from or different from the private profits that are crucial to the sustenance of the private industries or enterprises. Traditionally, the, the revenue streams that are handy and that we have known are advertising and sales of the different media products, programs, newspapers, magazines to the consumers. Advertising has played a major role. Sales to consumers in certain areas, for example, music, movies, and books form a major chunk, maybe to the tune of 75 to 80 percent. However, in the segment of entertainment, that is through television and news and newspapers, magazines, advertising takes the major pie and it plays a major role. During the last 20 years or so, with the coming of new technologies, digital technologies or other convergence of the traditional technologies with emphasis on interactivity, with emphasis on speed and transparency. Now the traditional media are losing their audiences. Television, newspapers, radio are losing their audiences to mobile and internet and other interactive platforms. It is to be understood that in a day there are only 24 hours and 
in a week there will be 24 into 7 hours. If you are spending more time with mobile and internet or with your iPod listening to music, necessarily you are spending less time to watch television, less time on newspaper reading, less time on radio listening. The time cannot be stressed in any manner. With this in view, one can understand that the audience is spending more time on new media platforms. The time is spent with respect to traditional media has gone down and with this the advertising money has also gone down. The advertisers have started withdrawing from these traditional media and these traditional media platforms are looking for alternative revenue streams. Whenever such alternative systems come up, you have investors coming up to play a very important role. And before the investors, the traditional investors come up, there are venture capitalists. As it happened in 2000, in 1995 to 2000, 2005, with the coming of the dot-com companies in a big way and their overvaluation and a good number of individuals and companies pouring in money with a lot of expectations as it happens with the coming of any new technologies. And if you recall, in the early 20th century it had happened. The same thing had happened with the automobile industry. There were close to 200 companies operating in the sector in the United States alone. How many of them are operating today? in the United States or even globally. You cannot reach this 200 figure if you add all the companies even globally. It happens to begin with. But ultimately, when there is overvaluation, overestimation of the returns, there is a bubble followed by a bust. As it happened in 2005-7, many uh, dot-com companies are nowhere to be seen. The companies which had monumental valuations in the early 21st century for the first years, few years of the 21st century. Now let's have a look at the ownership structures. Ownership structures could be individual, it could be proprietorship, it could be joint venture, it could be a joint stock company. However, as the business progresses and as the demand of the stakeholders for greater profits increases, there are economies of scale operating. That is, you have to produce more and more products, more and more programs, more pages of, say, newspapers and magazines and more programs on radio with the same amount of cost, with the same amount of money involved in the production of the programs or the content. This leads to mergers and acquisitions. As it happened in ComSat, in the, the US, the Comcast was earlier operating in the cable sector, in the distribution sector. Later on, it took over NBC Universal, which was basically in the content domain. And this led to one of the highest media mergers and the emergence of a conglomerate that was Comcast NBC Universal. In 2011, that was $51.2 billion. Recently, last year in India, TV18 Viacom 
took over Inadu Television. Inadu Television had a very rich bouquet across around uh, more than 10 languages, so almost covering entire gamut of languages and a very wide footprint in the Indian television news space. Such things do happen, but there the interest of a conglomerate is to respond to the demands of the stakeholders, the private individuals, or the individuals, a group of individuals, whereas the role of the government, the role of the avowed role of the media systems is to maintain diversity, to give voice to richness, all kinds of people, maybe less in number, maybe more in number, but their voices are heard. Nobody or no group is ignored just because their number is less or the community of the group doesn't have enough money to pay for the content that they deserve or that is of, their, of use to them. But this doesn't happen with conglomerates. The advertisers start dictating the terms. A few people with the deep pockets or the people who have the capacity to buy the goods and services advertised on the television channels or different media platforms, they start impacting the choice of content because they are able to buy the goods and services advertised on those channels. That decreases diversity, that also decreases the, the deepening of the democratic spirit in a country like India, which is so diverse. However, once you start maturing or you reach that stage, of maturity, you tend to ignore certain challenges posed by the new minds, the young minds, or the new media, or new technologies, and your size becomes a curse, your size becomes a problem for you. In 2007, as it happened in the United States, many companies started or wanted to sell off their properties, but there were not many takers for the simple reason that if the new technology has provided a different kind of choice, a newspaper or television is not going to compete with mobile or internet on the same turf. It is usually late for a behemoth to, to respond to such challenges because when you are at the level of maturity, you are confident enough to ignore the challenges posed by new technologies, new demands, new choices of the audiences. However, there is not only one kind of ownership. The traditional kind of ownership in the capitalist system is from individual to, to maybe joint stock companies, before that you may have even partnerships, that ultimately leads to conglomerates. And the conglomerates or media moguls like Rupert Murdoch can go to any extent as it, as it is seen both in the United States as well as in the United Kingdom to ensure their profits if not in the short run, definitely in the long run, which goes against the very spirit of democracy. In addition to that, the financial problems, the, the chinks or holes in the traditional revenue streams of advertising and direct sales or indirect sales to consumers 
necessitate that one can have or one should have or society should have or go for alternative media ownership structures. For example, one is known as institutional sponsorship. The most effective and that the example that applicable till date or that is surviving till date is that of Chicago Federation of Labor which operated a radio station in Chicago that was known as WCFL. So there was a labor union that was operating a radio station. Another is Christian Science Monitor that evolved as a very major newspaper but later on converted itself into a magazine and also an online newspaper that was started in 1908 by Mary Baker Eddy by her group that was Christian Science Church. The motive of Christian Science Church was not to promote Christian values in general but the motive was to bring forth the positive aspects of life, to bring to the fore certain good things that inspire individuals to come up and work for the society, for the community, for the country. That was the motive. And since then, that group that is Christian Science Church has sponsored Christian Science Monitor. This doesn't mean that they do not go for subscription revenue, they do not go for advertising, but their sole dependence on advertising and subscription is definitely not there, which ensures a sort of diversity in content, a sort of content which is <coughs> not promoting sensationalism to garner greater profits in the short run. There are community foundations which are operating radios and uh, even newspapers. Rockefeller Foundation had proposed recently in the United States to uh, come up with certain funds to promote investigative journalism in <coughs> sorry, the United States. There are cooperatives. The cooperatives are basically non-profits and one of the most powerful cooperatives with presence all over the globe is the Associated Press that was started in the United States in 1848 by uh, the newspapers, the newspapers who subscribe to the service provided by the Associated Press to cut on the costs that were used because each newspaper was going to collect the same kind of news and so there was duplication of the cost and once they joined hands and promoted Associated Press, their news gathering costs went down heavily. In recent times, certain foundations have also come up to promote uh, media generation or information gathering, news gathering in the societies to the society's advantage. California universities at Berkeley, Northwestern universities, they have got certain funds from certain organizations and foundations to, to do it. The other kind of ownership is family ownership. To start with, if an organization is run by a family, it has got its own advantages. The advantages could be uh, because of the pride of ownership, because the one who starts has got deep interest in it, has got a very uh, operational 
and deep understanding of the business. And at times it is also personality driven. So this is efficient to start with. But this is not necessary that the successive generations of that business or of that unit also take the same kind of interest. The most important example that comes to my mind in the Indian context is that of ours newspaper, which was a very dominant newspaper in the pre-independence period. And in the next 25, 30, 40 years following the independence after 1947, that continued to command tremendous readership, but the successive generations of the proprietors lost their interest. And now this is not so important a newspaper as it used to be maybe 30 years back or 25 years back. So it happens. Now let's look at certain another aspects, one important aspect or a challenge that is with the proprietorship is. In certain countries, when you move from one person to another person, I mean the ownership, when you inherit a company as an individual, you end up paying a huge amount of tax. In certain cases, this inheritance tax is to the tune of 55%. In common parlance, this is known as death tax, meaning if you own a company from your father or your parent, if you have to retain your ownership in that, you have to sell a substantial share to others because if you are going to pay 55% tax, naturally you are not going to have a major stake in the company. And if you are going to say 55% to one individual or one company or one joint stock company or major corporation, your say in that reduces drastically. In certain economies or countries, such a policy is promoted or implemented with a view to reduce the importance of the family ownership because family ownership it is believed is against the diversity of content and involvement of less number of people as stakeholders in the operation of that particular uh, unit. Nowadays, with the traditional sources of revenue, that is advertising and sales to consumers, be it through subscription of uh, television channels or newspapers or magazines by the audience. The new f types of fundings are coming up. They are known as, if you wish, hybrid. For example, the combined advertising and direct sales with other ways of earning money. One, of course, is government funding. In the government funding, as you will see, uh, in the case of India, DAVP. If you are registered with them and if you have got certain uh, level of audience or readership, they give you, they would give you advertisements at certain rates in certain four pages, three pages, five pages in a year or twice in a year. And that becomes an important source, especially of income to these small units or units with a small operations or a small budgets. Then there are philanthropies. The philanthropies may also come up with certain donations and charities to newspapers or magazines or uh, television channels or radio to help them sustain their uh, business. Uh, in modern times, the I companies particularly, which are rich in resources, have started underwriting certain programs with public interest. There are certain programs which are in the interest of the public maybe polio eradication program or maybe certain diseases that are rampant and more than the need of a doctor or more than the treatment by a doctor, you need to prevent the diseases and for that the public awareness programs are launched and there are programs on television which have got baiting content.
that educate the audiences about those diseases or about that problem. So that is a sort of, they call it underwriting. But th this is also a kind of a mix of advertising and philanthropy because once you are produ the promoting your product or your service along with that underwriting process of the program, that is a sort of uh, advertising. There can be no uh, doubt about it. In the developed economies, especially in the local markets, it is uh, observed that certain radio stations which are which have got uh, very deep roots and uh, long standing relationship with their audiences, they go for fundraising drives. They would ask their listeners that please donate money and say if you donate more than $500, uh, your name would be announced or your name would be prominently made public so that you get certain kind of advantage by way of respect that is attributed to uh, donations to a public cause. Other thing which has become very handy is unbundling of the content which has been made possible because of the interactive digital technologies which have the capacity to provide to you only well, the kind of content that you want, only well, the kind of content for which you have got time. For example, the sports fans or the sports lovers, if you see them reading a the newspaper, they will not go to the first page, they will not go to the crime page, they will not go to the political page, they will straight away open the sports pages. Or even on channels you will see that there are certain kinds of people who will only watch the cricket matches or football matches or wrestling or maybe golf. So these are mis audiences and these people would like to have the kind of uh, information or news which are of their interest. These are micro payments. So these provide avenues for micro payments. So you are going to pay for the kind of content you watch. You are not going to pay for uh, watching whole of the program or whole all the content that is provided by a channel in a day or in a week. For a particular program you are going to pay. That is pay per view that could be provided, that is being provided because of the choices available, uh, choices made available through the interactive and digital and customized technologies, interactive technologies in particular, that is called unbundling of the content. Earlier the newspaper had all kinds of content, even today it has. Most of the TV channels would have all kinds of news content, maybe in due course of time, globally in our country also, you will be paying for, if you are interested in educational news, you will be paying for that much only. If you are interested in political news, you will be paying for listening to or watching only political news. If you are interested in the news pertaining to crime and sex, possibly you will be paying for that much only. You will be not paying for all the bouquet or all the kinds of content that are available on or made available by a television. Uh, channel. Then there are auxiliary enterprises. News gathering or information gathering is a very, very costly affair, very costly affair. And if it involves research, if it involves long time research, then it becomes all the more costly as well as risky. However, if the information and news are gathered, by other channels, by other platforms, by other companies, then you can retailer, repurpose the same content to the needs of different niche audiences. Because what has happened with the coming of the digital and interactive technologies over the last 20 years, there has been demassification of the, of the audience audience till a few years back was a mass, a huge mass. Today they are segmented, 
Today, they are fragmented. As a teacher, as a professor, I may be interested more in the news pertaining to universities, a news pertaining to colleges, news pertaining to the government policy towards education, news pertaining to the behavior of the students in a classroom, news pertaining to the manner in which an average student would like to be taught through maybe mobile or the internet or television channel. I am not interested in the rest of the kind of information and news. That is known as fragmentation of the audience. This demassification, segmentation or fragmentation of the audience creates a situation where the existing content can be repackaged, it may be customized, it may be tailored, it may be repurposed to the needs of the different age groups, different tastes, different communities, different income groups or even different uh, cultures. That has become a new thing during the last 10, uh, 15 uh, years. If you compare the uh, business pattern of the different industries over the last few um, decades or centuries, you will realize that media economics would have the same kind of uh, phases in development with regard to the media industries. The phase one is that of invention, when a new technology comes and with the new technology would come the possibility to make new businesses, do new businesses, as it happened with radio. Guglielmo Marconi came up with radio, but he didn't have the kind of business instinct or understanding of how radio was going to be used in every household as a mass medium. Others did it. So invention is followed by entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship needs an understanding of the business potential and it also involves a great amount of risk taking capacity. Out of say 100 entrepreneurs, hardly 2 or 3 will survive. So the failure rate is very high among entre entrepreneurs. But it is the entrepreneurs that really bring to the masses an invention as it happened with the internet and mobile, we will see during the last uh, 15 years uh, or so. After entrepreneurs, a few entrepreneurs successfully saw that uh, either invention or technology is working, then you will have the same segment, economic segment developing as an industry. An industry happens when there is imitation. Success begets success. Success begets growth. So there will be people who will be imitating their entrepreneurs. And maybe in due course of time, you will not even remember the entrepreneurs and others who have imitated well, who have engaged in some sort of copycat production, copycat business, would be doing much better with the less risk involved. And once you have the industry stage of development or phase of development, you will have some kind of phase of maturity. The maturity leads to understanding amongst different stakeholders to arrive at certain standards. For example, transmission standards amongst television producers so that different consumers, different sellers, different retailers and wholesalers and transmitters or those who are engaged in the business of transmission would not have problems. You can see with the newspapers, certain width of newspapers, certain length of newspapers. You have tabloid size, you have got other sizes, the normal size. That is to ensure better business and that is to reduce confusion amongst the advertisers, 
amongst other stakeholders, the readers, the producers, the technicians, etc. Then you have got the final stage when you have become settled in that particular business. Once you are settled in that business, you become igno not you become so confident that you start ignoring the new challenges posed by new choices, new consumer choices, posed by new technologies. However, the new technologies and new demands of the audiences do not stop. History has its own method. History has its own way of working on technology and the consumer choices. So first if we ignore, and when it is difficult to ignore, you will start resisting the change. You can resist the change by going to the government. You can go to the government and request or lobby with the government to come up uh, with a policy that favors you. For example, you can ask the government to reduce all kinds of import duties, excise duties, and other taxes on your product. But these are all short term. In the long run, such medicines provided by the government and other agencies are not going to work if you tend to ignore the challenge posed by technology and the new consumer choices. In the end, when we are on the verge of collapse as a very settled industry, you engage in radical reforms by way of mergers and acquisitions, by way of reducing the size of your workforce, but that also will not sustain the industry in the long run. It will have to adopt the new technology, new businesses. As it has happened in the West with regard to the newspapers, many established newspapers operating for centuries have closed or down their shutters and they have moved online. Even in India today, there is hardly a newspaper without its own website. You have got Times of India, you have got Economic Times, you have got Sun Times, you have got Pioneer or Hindu. All of them have, are in search of an alternative revenue stream by way of their uh, websites. And these websites are of various types. They want to cater to the traditional interest by saying that they are coming with the e-paper. The e-paper is a replica of the traditional newspaper, whereas the usual website is in tune with the grammar, in tune with demands of the consumers accessing uh, a website. In due course of time, what has happened in addition to such things is that uh, markets are evolving. Uh, the traditional market structures of uh, say uh, monopoly or monopolistic uh, competition or oligopoly or duopoly are not enough to understand the situation. Hybrid structures have uh, come up and the business has become multi-platform. For example, earlier there used to be only television or maybe only newspaper or only radio. Today you will have a newspaper with its own radio station, with its own website that is providing content to the mobile service through the mobile service providers as well. It will have other media platforms. That is content produced, it's gathered by one image, one person or a group of person, persons are now being utilized on various platforms. They are customized to the needs of audiences. That is multi-platform device. So the business model will have to be multi-platform. The business model will have to be multi-revenue system. It will not be single revenue system which has been the case or advertising or direct sales to the consumer in through one platform. That has been the case for the last few uh, centuries with the traditional media of radio, television, newspapers or uh, magazines. And the market structures, if you look at, you will find that 60 to 70 percent of market is controlled by four or five operators. 
And in that you will have, if you look at the traditional way of looking at a business, would be sort of oligopoly. That is a few people, a group of uh, companies controlling a major chunk of the business. And in the rest 30% or 40% you will have some sort of monopolistic competition where there are a small players but large in number, larger than that you have in the oligopoly fighting for a small cake uh, in the business. All this has become possible because technology has provided us with choices and these choices are indicative of different kinds of demographics. For example, in our country, 65 to 70 percent of the population is young. India today is known as the youngest country in the world. We may have a very ancient civilization tracing, uh, traced back to around 10,000 years or more, but we are the youngest country today. And most of the developed countries are not young if you go by their uh, demographics. That is why you will find on television, newspapers, magazines or other media platforms, the content that is coming up is tailored to the needs or requirements of the young people from say 15 to 30 or 35. These choices are being taken note of. Uh, by the media pro content uh, providers in a big way and this has become possible because of the interactive technology, the digital technology which is able to do it in a speedy manner, efficient manner, interactive manner at a much less uh, cost. However, while discussing all these aspects, one thing that we tend to ignore is the uh, role of government and I will wrap up with the role of the government. Whether the government is having sole ownership as it happens in most of the totalitarian regimes like uh, say China or Cuba and the earlier USSR and some of the developing countries as well today, the government plays a major role by way of owning the media systems. Then you don't have this problem of finances whereas if you are operating along the lines of the private profit or for profits. There also the role of government is important where the government provides you certain kinds of indirect subsidy by way of reduced taxes, by way of uh, charging you less money uh, through reduced postal charges, etc. It can also allow you to pull in your resources so that you can cut on your uh, costs. So government, even in a capitalist economy or the capitalist system, does play a very important role by way of providing tax holidays or tax exemption in many operations. For example, in the newspaper industry in the country, the newsprint costs is subsidized. No newspaper prices are subsidized heavily by the government with a view to provide news and information, diverse information in news for the diverse public at a lesser cost. Uh, with this I open the forum to questions uh, by you and by my host uh, Mr. Amrinder Kumar who has been a wonderful host prompting me to do things in a manner which even I didn't know that I would be able to do it. So Mr. Amrinder. So, uh, one thing which I wonder because uh, this is an information age, information itself is a money and solve all the kind of problems. So, uh, uh, um, uh, what we were, uh, just uh, come to know that uh, many of the uh, in newspaper, the media organizations shut down because of the lack of the fund or support from the external sources. So, can we say that uh, they are not competing and not getting the information which the people seek? because uh, and that's why they have to pull down their uh, business or whatever it is. Uh, uh, if they have information, even single information can make them profit and they will be able to run the organizations. Uh, there are two aspects 
to this. One is that one kind of platform, for example, say television, mm. once it develops and matures as an industry, audience also get accustomed to the kind of content that television provides. But more than that, the television industry also gets accustomed to news and information mm -hmm. gathering and producing entertainment programs in a certain way and delivering to their audiences. But as new technologies come, they are able to cater to the emerging needs. If you want to watch television, you will have to sit in your room, you will have to sit in a drawing room, and you have to find a special time for it. And suppose you are hard pressed for time, you don't have enough time to spend 30 minutes or 40 minutes in the morning or uh, in the afternoon or in the evening. It would be very difficult for you to watch television. But you still you want information, you still you want news, you still you want entertainment, infotainment or entertainment. It is in this context that television industry will have to make room for or a space for or lose advertising revenue to say internet or say mobile or mm. other platforms or say iPod. It is because the new technologies is providing choices to the audiences as per their own convenience. Mm. Suppose it should not sound funny because in the market research this is considered very important. It is found, observed, that the safest time to reach a top decision maker, a CEO or a chairman and a managing director is when he or she is in her car, one, two, or flying from one business destination to another, or when in the, the toilet where nobody is going to interfere with the time that is available to her or him. So they would like to target those times, those time slots. And those time slots would not be so easy to target through newspapers. Mobile could be the easiest medium mm -hmm. for them. So the, uh, keep eye on that uh, on because persons are busy with other words. So the time um, uh, factor is now dominating the whole thing in the, um, uh, we can say the media business. Because finally we have to go to the people and if they don't have time, don't, uh, don't read it. So mobile has captured, we have uh, wiped out all the possibility of um, these things. So uh, what you see from here now, uh, how this uh, the revenue model or the uh, uh, so the information, uh, as you said, there are uh, number of uh, organizations that pouring the information. So how this will come from here to 10 years down the line? You see, uh, the most important thing that is going to happen during uh, the next few decades in terms of the emerging business model would be a very hybrid kind of business model. The hybrid business model would in include advertising, of course, revenue through advertising. It would include the direct sales to the consumer. But within that, we will have many other agencies playing a very important role. Mm -hmm. And also the payment through micro systems. When I say micro systems, of payment, I mean that you pay only for that amount or that kind of content or for that time that you are hooked mm -hmm. to mobile or internet or television channel or radio or a website so that a small, small payments or penny payments okay. through made, directly made by the users mm -hmm. or consumers or the audiences would make up for the losses that are occurring by way of advertising that have gone to the other uh, segments. Mm -hmm. And that is possible because technology has now moved from the mass, uh, or I would say broadcasting to narrow casting, from mass production to individual production to customized production to customize delivery of the content. Right. So this interactive technology 
making possible delivery of the content and information to individuals in response to their customized needs is going to fuel the new kind of revenue models or new sources of revenue. So small, small payments aggregated will possibly make up for the, the losses that may happen because of the traditional uh, revenue that is advertising. Okay, this is the maybe solution to the revenue model, but how do you see this, uh, the particular news uh, or the particular section, uh, suppose uh, financial or the political, will help to make the uh, mindset of the people, the perspective on something, how that will change, because if you are, you are uh, keeping your uh, eyes and ears closed for the other things, so will this... Uh, uh, bring a kind of change. Uh, yeah, I get your point. Uh, generally, uh, through mass, uh, traditional mass media uh, vehicles like newspaper or television, mm -hmm. we have been listening to information together uh, in, almost at the same time, lakhs and crores of people watching television and getting informed. So that way they are forming a social group mm -hmm. and they are even more capable uh, to take a decision in the social interest or public interest because they have become aware. But it is also true, as you will find in during the recent elections okay. to the Delhi Assembly, that through social networking sites, mm -hmm. people have joined or formed different groups that belong to different interests, and they are keeping tab on what others are saying. And not only they are keeping tab on what others are saying, they are able to be informed and respond to a situation as per their own convenience. Without any advertisement through newspaper or television, you will find that uh, lakhs and lakhs of people are coming together to protest against something or to support something mm -hmm. in public interest. So I think that this new technology has definitely posed a threat to this kind of social building and community building. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they have provided avenues where we can come together successfully and make the change happen, make the change possible. Okay, so well friends, with this way we conclude the lecture. I thank all of you for watching the lecture and on behalf I thank Dr. Siping Singh for giving such a wonderful lecture. Thank you very much.